In Dungeons and Dragons, the gods obtain power from the faith of their followers. The more followers a god has, the more power he possesses, but it doesn't end there. Not every follower is the same, of course, as you can imagine. The more faith a person has, the more power he provides to their god. And then there are different kinds of prayers that one can make. Simply spending two hours on a Sunday afternoon in a church is pretty good, but it's not going to beat a group of five fanatical clerics sacrificing a maiden in a glorious ritual. The power the gods have and why they have them is a very interesting topic that I want to delve deep into today, but before we get into that, this video is brought to you by me. Please go ahead and check out my store at mrrex.shop. We currently have two fantastic PDFs that will make your Dungeons & Dragons experience much, much better. So the first one we have here is what they don't tell you about Dragon Hordes. It consists of tons of really interesting information that exists within the lore of D&D that we have never gotten in 5th edition. A lot of it focused on looting and harvesting dragons. We cover the power of dragon blood and all the magical rituals that one can do with things like dragon bones, dragon scales, and so forth. We got dragon-related magic items, draconic subclasses, and even real draconic spells that exist within the Dungeons & Dragons lore. And did you know that dragons, for example, can cast a spell that allows them to create an effect that functions like the Bag of Holding, where they can turn their stomach into a Bag of Holding? And that way they could swallow their hordes and carry it with them if they needed to. There are tons of really interesting dragon spells, and I did a lot of research to find you the best ones within the old lore. There's some really good lore info here, guys. You cannot miss it. We also have Monster Classes 1, which is an expansion to the amount of classes players get access to. If you're tired of playing fighters or barbarians or rogues, it is time to try playing a monster. See, traditionally in older D&D editions, you could do this. If you wanted to play like an ogre, you could, and this came with its own abilities and class features. You also used to be able to pick classes in very esoteric specializations. So like, you could be, for example, like a goblin berserker or something. And then you would pick levels in that class, which was really awesome. Well, I wanted to bring that feeling back to allow you to pick something new, exciting, and unique. And I have taken a lot of effort to make sure that they are balanced and treated with the respect that they deserve. We got the succubus, the diva, and the ghost with really cool class features and tons of elements that will truly make you feel like you're playing the real thing. We got more coming too, by the way. We got the ogre, the dragon, and the lycanthrope in the works, so there's tons of new content coming on as well. We should hopefully have it done by the end of the month. Any support that you guys are willing to give me will be unimaginably helpful. If you wanted to support the channel and all the work that goes into the videos, the best way that you can do that is by purchasing any of the PDFs. We're finally getting to the point where I can start to diminish the amount of sponsorships that I run on the channel, and hopefully soon, we could even get to the point where I could remove all the ads on my videos. That would be amazing if we could do that. Even better, with your support on these PDFs, we could even start focusing on bigger videos that are longer rather than having to make a lot of short ones to, to focus more on quality rather than quantity. Videos like this one, for example, take a lot of work, especially the ones that get closer to the one hour mark. But the, these videos, this one included, are by far the best. So, so if I could do more like these, that would be amazing. So thank you all so much for the support on the PDFs. Uh, the website is mrrax.shop. The, the link is also in the description. You guys are truly the greatest. Now, back to the video. There are many factors that one has to take into consideration when it comes to the power of a deity. We have talked about a lot of this before. If you're interested, I would particularly recommend these videos over here to get you started on what kind of power gods can have. Today, though, we're going to talk about one of the most powerful gods in Dungeons and Dragons. Now, you might be wondering, why not the most powerful? Well, that is because, in fact, there is a three-way tie for the title of the most powerful god in Dungeons and Dragons, and that's only if you consider the traditional fantasy gods that were designed specifically for this universe. See, Nordic, Egyptian, and Greek gods technically do exist in D&D. We have talked about this before on our videos as well. See, Anubis from the Egyptian pantheon is actually the caretaker for dead deities, and you can literally find him in the astral plane just roaming around. That is actually canon. And so the chieftains of those pantheons technically also have a power level that is equivalent to the deities from the Forgotten Realms, which we know of. Zeus and Odin both have a divine rank of 19, and so does Ra Horakti, which is a combination of the Egyptian god of the sun, Ra, and the Egyptian sky god, Horus. They together combined have a divine rank of 19. 
Now, the, the rank of 19 is technically the highest that you can ever get in virtually any kind of polytheistic religion, a religion with multiple gods. That is because the assumption is that a god that has somewhere between the rank of 16 to 19 is what you might call a world creator, a, a deity that effectively has the capabilities to either form a planet or populate it in some way. And the general idea is that the god can't quite do it all without the support of other deities, which would support the weaknesses for the other god. For example, a, a badass god of death might not be able to create life, or a god of magic might not be as good at creating mundane mountains, etc, etc. For a god to be able to reach the fabled divine rank of 20 or 21, which 21 would be the maximum, the god would need to have the ability to effectively do everything on its own, basically making him a creator of universes. Realistically, this is saved up for the monotheistic religions like Christianity, Judaism or Islam, which I guess is technically the same guy, but you get what I mean. The idea is that you would just have the god, and that god just created everything. That god would have a divine rank of 21. Now, as far as the specific Dungeons and Dragons gods are concerned, like we mentioned before, we got three. One of them is the human deity of agriculture, Shantia. The other is the leader of the Elvish Pantheon and the god of magic and arts, Corellon Lorethian. And then, the topic for today's video, which you should have guessed since this will officially conclude our dwarf arc, the chieftain god of the Dwarvish Pantheon and a god of creation, Moradin. So uh, this is how this is going to go. Uh, first, we will talk about Moradin himself. Then we will cover his stats, because yes, we, we actually do have his stats. And then we will touch on how dwarves revere him specifically. So wh what are we waiting for? Uh, let's get started. Uh, Moradin is seen as the literal creator of the dwarves, and so the dwarves in kind call him the All Father, literally meaning that they do see him as the actual father to all dwarves. The mythos claims that Moradin shaped each and every dwarf with his own anvil, crafting them from scratch and then blowing life into them. They claim that Moradin himself was born from rock, stone and metal, and that his soul is an eternally billowing moat of fire, and that it is through this fire that he grants life to all the dwarves. See, because of this, fire is ironically more important than even stone itself for the clerics of Moradin. Quote, the soul forger demonstrates his favor through the revelation of rare metals, by the appearance of a symbol on an anvil after a hammer blow, or on an item after it is removed from the forge, or by a nimbus of fire that envelops an item of great workmanship immediately after it is completed. The soul forger indicates his displeasure by the sudden breaking of an item in its crafting, by suddenly extinguishing a forge fire, or by causing an anvil to shatter into hundreds of pieces when struck." End quote. Now, Moradin's ability to create life is actually very rare. The soul is supposed to be this oddly difficult thing to create, though this part of the lore is a bit nebulous. And we don't know much about this either. See, originally, it, you might actually be very shocked to hear this. It's not the sort of thing that they tell you in the Monster Manuals anymore. <laughs> not every sentient species in D&D actually had souls. Humans, halflings, gnomes, and dwarves. These were the original species with souls. Other species like the elves or the orcs or the gnolls, for example, they had spirits instead of souls. The original concept was based on the fact that creatures like the elves or the orcs, they were supposed to reincarnate over and over again after they died, whereas humans, for example, would just die once and then go to their heaven. This had some very interesting implications in the gameplay, like for example, you used to not be able to resurrect elves because they didn't have souls. Now, stuff like this can make sense when you think about it this way. You know, why aren't evil gods just resurrecting all the evil monsters that you're slaying? Let's say that you destroy this enormous chimera that was like the villain of your adventure. Why wouldn't another bad guy or an evil god just resurrect it back? Well, the idea would be that they didn't have souls, they had spirits, and that would prevent the evil guides from doing that. But yeah, alas, that whole idea was just sort of retconned and scratched relatively early, so we don't do that anymore. In any case, Moradin could craft dwarves, and he does it all the time from his home in Mount Celestia. He resides on the fourth mountain called Solania, specifically in his hidden dwarvish kingdom underground, which is called Arachinor. There he lives with his wife, Bernard True Silver. His name, of course, as we mentioned before, is the Soul Forger because, well, you get why. <laughs> he didn't just forge all the dwarves though, but he even forged himself all of the other members of the Dwarvish Pantheon, who he rules over as a stern father. 
uh, dwarves actually have this very interesting uh, legend that Muradin created more than just the dwarves. That he in fact crafted all life when he was trying to populate the world. But he ended up not liking any of his creations until he decided to make them in his image, which is where the dwarves came from, and of course, he fell in love with them. It is unclear how much of this is true. We do know that he can indeed create life from scratch, and then he can imbue those creations with actual real souls. We also know that he can do this seemingly in a limitless capacity, and we know that he can send these creatures with souls into almost any world he desires. See, he does this through the most powerful artifact that Muradin possesses, his anvil, which is called the Soul Forge. It is said that whenever Muradin communicates with any dwarf, they can actually hear faintly the sound of smithing in the background as the Soul Forge is constantly worked on. If Muradin can do all of these things, then there would have been nothing to stop him from having made many non-dwarves before he realized that he really liked making dwarves. So it is honestly a very possible outcome that he might have populated many worlds with countless strange creatures before he set on the dwarf figure. Now, the, the Soul Forge itself is a very fascinating artifact, not just because it can create life, but also because it can open portals to anywhere in the multiverse. And the best part is that Muradin doesn't hoard it for himself. He actually let many other dwarves use it for their own designs. Though, of course, there is a very rigorous waiting period to be able to use it since, you know, there, there are quite a few dwarves who would want to do this, and there are quite a few dwarves in the multiverse. You know, there's actually a very funny passage in Planescape that says that Muradin has no tolerance for creatures that sit still, not doing anything. And so, if he finds a dwarf that doesn't appear to be creating or working, he grabs them and opens up a portal using the Soul Forge, and then just sends them towards a random dwarvish outpost in a random world that needs help. Now, even funnier, if that person happens to be a human instead of a dwarf or any other creature, he will sculpt the creature into the shape of a dwarf and then send it into a random dwarvish settlement that needs help. He can literally turn people into dwarves. Quote, Muradin is a stern paternal deity, gruff and uncompromising and hard as stone when it comes to protecting his chosen race. A harsh but fair judge, he is the strength and force of will embodied. He inspires dwarven inventions and constantly seeks to improve that race, encouraging their good nature, intelligence, and harmonious existence with other good races while battling their pride and isolationist tendencies. His Warhammer is a weapon and a tool called Soul Hammer." End quote. Now, Soul Hammer, his weapon, is actually well, exactly a Dwarven Thrower. It is a maximally upgraded Warhammer, so back in 3rd edition that would basically mean a plus 5, but for 5th edition that would be a plus 3 weapon. It can be thrown to deal damage, at which point it returns back to Muradin's hands. But yeah, this is a, a good segue here to talk about his combat abilities and what you would experience if you were to meet the guy. So, first and foremost, we're going to be talking primarily about his avatar here. See, because he is a Divine Rank 19 deity, well, his real form is basically invincible and can do anything. And I mean literally, it can do anything. Gods of this level can just create worlds, they can shape the things around them into anything that they desire. They can just point at a person and instantly kill it. I mean, it's it's kind of unfair. So it would be very weird to describe it in, in rigorous detail because it's just kind of useless. What we're going to do instead is we're going to talk about what happens when he communicates or directly deals with the world, which is a way more interesting conversation. The first thing that you need to know is that he prefers what we call manifestations rather than actual avatars. See, a manifestation is essentially a spontaneous occurrence that the divinity creates in order to communicate or, you know, create an effect that can be perceived in the material world. An avatar, on the other hand, is when the god creates a weaker version of itself in order to become fully present in the material world. Quote, Muradin seldom appears in the realms, preferring to work through manifestations rather than avatars. His usual reason for an appearance, in either form, is to encourage dwarves to follow the correct paths or make the best decisions at critical times. He will also appear to aid or inspire dwarves that he wants to survive to serve the race in the future, or as an example or encouragement to non-dwarves who aid the dwarves." End quote. 
when more than manifest, it usually does so as a wide radiance that encompasses either peoples or objects, typically warhammers whenever it is given the chance. When it encompasses a person, it'll generally grant that person a blessing that takes on the form of a powerful clerical spell. When it encompasses an object, it'll basically function like a spiritual weapon, which will either attack enemies or will direct dwarves to where they need to go. When Muradin produces an avatar, he usually does so as a 20-foot tall dwarf, plainly dressed and with a long white beard that reaches his knees. He wears furs and a smith's leather leggings and aprons. So kinda like a normal dwarf smith, except of course for the fact that he is literally 20 feet tall, which is crazy, but also for the radiant and beautiful golden braces that he wears on his wrists. On top of this, his entire person radiates a powerful aura that looks like a white radiance. This radiance is powerful because it can take on the shape of a fear aura like Dragon Scan, or it can take on the form of a bless effect on allies while simultaneously being a bane effect on enemies. Or it can take on the form of an effect that makes it so that everyone that fails an insanely high DC becomes incapacitated as they completely just feel awed at the presence of the god. Oh, and Muradin can also make this aura about a 900 feet radius. So that's a, that's a god for you. When in combat, Muradin can instantly summon his battle gear, which comprises of soul hammer, his weapon, and also a set of dwarven crafted plate mail plus three, and a dwarven crafted shield plus three. The plate mail and the shield do not appear, however, to have any extra abilities other than just being plus three, which is still pretty freaking good. Then there's, of course, the aforementioned golden brazers, which are also a powerful combat armor piece. See, if you barely miss an attack against Muradin by, say, you know, one, two, or, or three points, then you're supposed to assume that Muradin deflected the attack with the bracers instead of just fully missing. And if that happens, they transmit an energy discharge dealing massive radiant damage to the attacker. The special abilities that the avatar of Muradin possesses are, of course, extraordinary, being basically the most powerful god in D&D. Even in his avatar form, which is substantially weaker than his real form, he is still an extremely powerful deity. To put it into perspective, his avatar form has its own divine rank of 9, which already makes him more powerful than many gods' true divine forms. For example, Tiamat and Bahamut both have a divine rank of 10 in their true fully powered forms. So just a single avatar of Muradin could stand toe to toe with Tiamat in her own lair in Avernus. But yeah, let's talk about actual tangible numbers, shall we? I figured that you guys would get a kick out of this. So if your dungeon master went ahead and just like summoned an avatar of Muradin, the crazy bastard, he would have 1,461 hit points. He would have 46 strength, 24 dexterity, 36 constitution, 24 intelligence, 28 wisdom, and 29 charisma. The avatar's AC would be at a minimum 26. This would be basically just taking into consideration his armor and shield and not taking into account any bonuses that he might receive from being a divine avatar. We know from the lore what kind of bonuses an avatar is supposed to get to their AC for just being a god, but the problem is that that AC was calculated very differently back in older editions. So I, I can't really easily transfer it over to 5th edition without it just like making it up, which I don't want to do. I, I am giving you the things as they are without me rigging or really changing anything. So for example, uh, let me explain how this works. Moradin has a standard 20 hit dice as a creature, which is what he was given originally. Most gods actually start with this just as, as a base. Now, because his natural form is a dwarf, which is supposed to be a medium-sized creature, that hit dice takes on the form of a d8. Uh, this is a rule that exists in the Dungeon Master's Guide for figuring out hit dice for monsters. If you are a medium-sized creature, then your hit dice is a d8. If you're a large, then that would be a d10, for example. So this particular hit dice, of course, uh, changes dramatically depending on the size that Muradin decides to take. If he wants to take on the form of a colossal creature, then the hit dice would also change to a d12, for example. Now, on top of this, however, Morden has 20 levels in Fighter, 15 levels in Cleric, and then 14 levels in a class that doesn't technically exist in 5th edition, but is basically like a bard, but without the singing part. 
It's like a class that focuses on skills and feats rather than actual combat prowess. So anyways, when you know this, the math is actually quite simple. We know that fighters have a d10 as a hit dice, clerics have a d8, and well, th that class that doesn't exist in 5th edition used to have a hit dice of d6. And so you basically add every single level's hit dice combined with the plus 13 modifier that he has on his constitution, and you get the insanely high 1,461 hit points that the Avatar of Morden possesses. The math is really just there. But I can't do the math for his AC because it used to be calculated differently and so I can only follow his gear. So that's why I say that he has a minimum AC of 26, with the potential of it being higher depending on what kind of bonuses he would get for just being divine, which, again, he is supposed to get. He should get a bonus, but I just cannot tell you exactly what it is. Now, the spell save DC for his spells would be 26 if you use the Dungeon Master's Guide table for proficiencies, since it is capped. See, technically, uh, Moradin is a level 69 character. N nice. And so, his proficiency modifier would be literally too high for it to be in any way balanced within the system. And so, uh, the best thing that we can do would be to go as high as 5th edition allows. Which, as you can see here on this table on the DMG, it's plus 9. So, if you calculate the spell safety C as you normally would, being 8 plus proficiency modifier plus, in this case, wisdom or charisma, since we're talking about his spells, then you get a spell save DC of 26. If we wanted to do some homebrew calculations, then we could say that a level 20 character has a proficiency bonus of plus 6, so it would stand to reason that a level 69 character would have a proficiency bonus of plus 21. If you follow the natural progression of how proficiency bonuses increase as you level up, which is basically every four levels. Uh, this would mean that the DC for Muradin's avatar spells would be DC 38, which is <laughs> insanity, of course. Now, thing is, the tables that we originally got in the lore for determining how gods get their stats do explicitly tell us that levels above 20 technically don't count the same way as levels below 20, specifically when you read charts like these. In theory, every level above 20 is supposed to be worth half a level when determining modifiers like these. Uh, this does not count HP, by the way, the HP is fine, but when determining saving throws and attack values, which in this case is, you know, the proficiency modifier that we use, then yes, every level above 20 is supposed to count as half a level. So, that means that if we want to stay true to it, then Moradin's avatar would have a proficiency modifier of plus 12. So his actual spell DC for spells would then be 29. So if you want to use pure, like, raw 5th edition rules, as the DMG says, his DC for his spells would be 26, but if you want to, like, kind of just make it real, like, what it would actually, what he would actually have, then it would be 29. Uh, 29 is harsh, but it, it does feel fair for a Divine Avatar, considering that you could definitely beat it if you have the right stats and meh, maybe just a little bit of luck. Now, that luck, however, would run out if we stopped talking about spells and instead uh, talked about his save DC for his physical abilities. See, Muradin's strength is way higher than his spellcasting stats. In fact, his modifier is literally double. He has 46 in strength, which means he has a plus 18 on his strength alone. So any save DC that he would require for you to bypass a physical challenge against him, for example, would be 38. A DC of 38, which is basically an instant loss. But yeah, as far as spell slots are concerned, uh, this would be here, the spread. He would have six cantrips and then nine first level spell slots, eight second level spell slots and so on, uh, up to having three ninth level spell slots. Uh, this is, I'm grabbing this from the lore, I'm not making this up, this is what he's given. But the developers of D&D gave him this. Hello, this is Rex from the future, just doing a little mend here uh, to, to clarify something. So spells were also done a tiny bit different back in 3rd edition. Generally speaking, spellcasters had more spell slots than ca uh, ca than casters do now in 5th edition. Uh, on average, but also because characters, the, the more intelligence they had, wizards in this case, the more spell slots they had. So you should also take this a little bit with a grain of salt. If you want to be like purely rule focused on this, then all you have to know is that he is a level 15 cleric. So whatever that would be in terms of spell slots, that's what he has. Many gods get extra bonuses to spell slots thanks to being gods, but that's only if they have the divine spellcasting feat, which is like a, a whole thing that gods could choose to pick if they wanted to, but in this case, 
Moradin did not have that, so you don't have to worry about it. He's just a level 15 cleric, as far as his avatar is concerned. Now, leaving the mechanical things aside and then talking more broad picture stuff, the avatar of Moradin is hilariously, by the way, completely immune to forged weapons because, well, I mean, at the end of the day, that is literally his portfolio, right? The, the forge. If you want to fight him with a weapon that was forged, your weapon will do no damage to the avatar, which is unironically uh, one of his most powerful features. He's also immune to basically any spell from the transmutation school of magic, including things like polymorph, petrification, or, or anything that seeks to alter his form. He's immune to any magic or ability that would reduce his stats or lower his maximum HP. He's immune to any kind of mind-altering effects like charm effects, illusions, or fears. Uh, this would include even tangential abilities like Shadow Blade, which is in fact a, a shadow-based illusion, better known as a phantasm-based spell. He's immune to lightning, cold, acid, fire, he's immune to disease, poison, stunts, sleep paralysis, disintegration, and any effects that seeks to instantly slay him. In addition, and you're gonna hate this, Muradin's avatar is immune to banishment or any spell that would bind him. Like, for example, Planar Binding or the 9th level spell Imprisonment. On top of all of this, uh, Muradin having a strong affinity with Earths grants him a very special ability called Divine Earth Mastery. Quote, the deity gains a borrow speed commensurate with its size, as well as the ability to glide through stone, dirt, or almost any other sort of earth except metal as easily as a fish swims through water. This borrowing leaves behind no tunnels or holes, nor does it create any ripple or other signs of its presence. The deity has tremor sense, allowing it to automatically sense the location of anything within 10 feet per divine rank that is in contact with the ground. The deity has complete control over all things made of earth, including stone and metal. It can alter the form of any amount of earth as a free action. The deity can duplicate the effects of the stone shape, move earth, rusting grasp, transmute rock to mud, transmute mud to rock, and disintegrate spells with any earth, stone, or metal object as a target. The deity can also transmute any object made of earth, stone, or metal into a different kind of earth, stone, or metal, such as changing a silver coin to gold. The deity can affect any object he can see, but no more than one object per round." End quote. That is unreal, by the way, that he can just swim through rock without disturbing the earth itself and then just disintegrate anything made out of metal at will, or simply change the metal into another metal whenever he wants to. He could stand in front of a massive fortress and just, just start disintegrating the walls, because presumably you would imagine that they would be made with either rocks or stones or metals. It, it's wild. Anything that's made out of these materials, he just controls at will. Now, of course, having creation and forging in his portfolio, Morden's avatar can also spontaneously just create things out of thin air. Whether to say, you know, equip a group of beleaguered dwarves that needs rescuing, or perhaps to reward a band of adventurers that performed a quest for him. The avatar can create magic items up to a maximum value of 30,000 gold pieces, which is huge. As you know, of course, he can change his looks to basically whatever he wishes. If he wanted to, he could make himself look like a Sahagan, though of course, he will always choose to be a dwarf because that's what he wants to be. Though what is really interesting is that he can also change his size at will, and the range Oh my god, the, the range of sizes that he has access to are like literally insane. The avatar of Muradin can make himself as small as a grain of sand or as tall as 1,600 feet. With that size, he would be as tall as the 12th tallest building in the world. Like, go look at a picture of the Shanghai World Financial Center. And people literally look like ants from that size looking down, it's crazy. Moradin would be the size of this tower if he wanted to. Now the funny thing is that he can allegedly also make objects, like other objects and other people, increase and decrease in size, but it is unclear whether he can make other things as tall as he can make himself, because that would be that would be kind of insane. <laughs> so so that's that's that for Moradin and his avatar. Um, keep in mind, you know, everything that I said here is, is pretty wild, but this is supposed to be the strongest god in Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, he and, you know, the, the chieftain god of the elves and, and then Chantia for the humans. Uh, if you see him walking around, just don't fight him, that would be silly. Now, we will finish our dwarf arc by talking about the Church of Muradin and how dwarves venerate him, which I feel like you guys should find very interesting. Quote, Moradin and his mortal servants are very highly regarded in Dwarven society and his priests often serve as leaders in Dwarven communities. 
a dwarven daily life is consumed with mining, smithcraft, engineering, and creative endeavors, and the Soul Forge's assistance is frequently acknowledged by most dwarven artisans. The only criticism of the Soul Forger's clergy, as expressed by younger dwarves who prefer the teachings of Dukmarin, Hela, and Martha Moore, is that Muradin's forcemiths are too set in their traditional ways and too slow to adapt to the changing world around them. Among the other human and demi-human races, Muradin's priests are perceived as prototypical dwarves and as the mortal manifestations of their god, and how this is interpreted depends on the viewer's general perception of and regard for dwarves. Temples of Muradin are located underground and carved out of solid rock. They are never set in natural caverns. Muradin's temples usually resemble vast smithies dominated by one or more grand halls of hard-working dwarven craftsmen. Hammers and anvils, the signs of the god, are the dominant decorative themes, as are statues of the Allfather and the other gods of the dwarven pantheon. The center of the Soul Forger's shrine or temple is a great ever-burning hearth and a forge of the finest equipage. Should the fire be extinguished, something the Soul Forger's priest will go to any length to prevent, the temple is abandoned or torn down stone by stone. Usually another temple is built on a new site, but occasionally the temple is entirely rebuilt and reconsecrated." End quote. See, like we mentioned before, because the soul of Muradin is supposed to be this ever-burning mode of fire, fire is just super important to the Dwarvish culture, and specifically to Muradin's priests. And so if the fire of the Smithy ever goes away, it is considered to be one of the greatest and most problematic like dark omens that one can get as a Dwarf. Now, if you're a new novice to the clergy, then you have the title of Unworked. If you're a full priest, then your title is either Forsmith or Tempered. There are, of course, as always, you know, many ranks into the clergy and they go as follows. You basically start as an adept of the anvil, then ascend to Hammer of War, then to Artisan of the Forge, then to Craftsman of Runes, then to Artificer of Discoveries, and then to Smith of Souls. If you happen to be a high-level priest and you're also the highest rank of the clergy, then you take the special spot called the High Forsmith. I do want to make a very important and very special distinction that uh, technically there is a difference between, you know, say being a priest and then being a cleric. As in, you know, you can serve your god and then be part of the church, but without necessarily having clerical spells. A, a generic priest of Muradin that also is given spells specifically by Muradin is called a Sunlinor, which of course is a dwarvish word which roughly translates to one who works stone. Uh, we mentioned it before in a previous video, but just to give you a straight number, about 94% of Muradin priests are male. See, by law, only male dwarves could be priests of male gods, and only female dwarves could be priestesses of female gods. Not every clan does this, however, so you do see a lot of the sexes breaching that barrier here and there. Typically, dwarves that live above ground and those who are separated from their ancestral homes tend to break these types of protocols a lot more than the dwarves who are segregated and isolationist underground. In any case, Muradin has a strong ethos that he shares with his priests, which in essence becomes the job of the priest. See, Muradin is in charge of basically formulating the entire mindset of the entire race, and so in essence, everything that we have talked about for the last three videos about how dwarven society functions and, and why it functions the way it does mostly comes from Muradin's commands. Think about, for example, the stereotype typical dwarf. Now, whatever you have in your head is what Muradin is, which is what he tells his priests to be, which is what they tell other dwarves to be. That's really how it works. But other than this, there is an interesting command that Muradin asks, which goes like this, quote, Wisdom is derived from life tempered with experience. Advance the dwarven race in all areas of life. Innovate with new processes and skills, and test and work them until they are refined and pure. Found new kingdoms and clan lands, defending those that already exist from internal and external threats. Lead the stout folk in the traditional ways laid down by the soul forger. Honor your clan leaders as you honor Muradin." End quote. See, the result of this command is what the job of the priests of Muradin have become. 
which effectively is to strive to restore the Dwarven races to strong numbers and towards a position of influence in the land. And they have to do this by basically founding new kingdoms and attempting to increase the status of Dwarves when compared to the now dominant race of humans. That being the ultimate goal, they attempt to do this through education of the young and by focusing hard, hard on history. Uh, the Dwarves have a fantastic and powerful history which creates very strong feelings of pride in each and every Dwarf, and the clergy of Muradin focuses hard on this to make sure that every Dwarf knows what is at stake and that they have a big role to play in the world. Clerics of Muradin make sure to catalog and remember the genealogies of many Dwarvish families and clans, and keeping strong archives so that everyone can see how far they have come. Now, for normal people to venerate Muradin, they typically offer worked metal of any kind to the church, preferably metal that has been worked by Dwarvish hands. Then the metal is reforged in the holy anvil of the temple into something that is usable by the clergy. Uh, the clergy takes advantage of these offerings by performing religious and sacred rituals using these metals. Since the process of transforming the offering from a random you know, metal shape and then shaping it into something that is useful is effectively like performing that which Muradin loves, which is crafting in general. So the clergy do these rituals that involve chanting, kneeling, and then reaching barehanded into the flames of the church while doing this. It is said that true believers of Muradin are never burned by the sacred forge fires of these temples, and so clerics of Muradin craft and forge items on these embers barehanded. Quote, Priests entering a temple of Muradin bow to the forge and surrender any weapons. Priests of Muradin strike the anvil standing by the entry once before surrendering them to the faithful Dwarven warriors. At least seven warriors are usually at any shrine, but four will always be there. Priests of another fate, without permission of a High Old One or the Avatar of Muradin, cannot advance beyond the Wall of Fire, a knee-high permanent magical effect surrounding the central forge. Priests of Muradin engage in humble verbal prayer and in open, earnest discussion of current Dwarven problems and issues, more so than any other priesthood. Such discussion is considered to be between equals, even if non-Dwarves participate, save that the ranking Priest of Muradin has the sole authority to open and close discussion on any particular topic." End quote. Traditional worship that does not involve crafting usually has the clerics perform chants in unison that become quicker and quicker over time. The chant goes, the dwarves shall prevail, the dwarves shall endure, the dwarves shall grow. This short chant gets repeated and repeated, like I said, faster and faster each time. And as the chant is going, if Muradin is pleased about the general event that this is about, then he will levitate a hammer that is usually left atop the sacred anvil. He will levitate the hammer and then very slowly and very gently touch the anvil with the tip. Now, even though the hammer is descending very gently, once it hits the anvil, it'll make a gong sound as if it was dropped by a powerful force with a mighty thunderous ring. And this would be an example of a huge positive sign. A lesser but still positive sign would be a simple manifestation, like something that we mentioned before, like a slight white glow on the hammer, for example. Now, a negative impression would be the hammer or the anvil breaking. The worst omen, of course, would be for the forge fires to go off, which of course would mean that the entire church would have to be <laughs> basically demolished and the new one would have to be created. But uh, Muradin would have to be really pissed for that to happen. Now, the priests of Muradin typically wear flowing, shining robes of woven wire of electrum treated with blue shine. They often carry silver warhammers, silver helmets, and earth brown leather boots. The holy symbol of the order is a miniature electrum warhammer treated with blue shine. Adventurer clerics of Muradin are clerics of war. They wore plate armor, a shield, and a warhammer, just like the Old Father himself does. Now, these specific clerics, the ones who are given magic by Muradin himself, are called Sonlinor, like we mentioned before, and these guys get some very interesting spells from Muradin. Uh, there is a first level spell called the Strength of Stone, which works like bark skin, except that instead of it giving you a minimum of 16 in armor class, it gives you a minimum of 16 in strength, which is kind of fun. Okay, well, so technically, it either gives you an extra 1d4 in your strength stat or gives you a 16, whichever is highest. This would last for about a minute or until you stop touching the ground. Now there is another spell that they get, which is a fourth level spell called Stone Fire. It makes it so that roaring flames appear from rocks, turning them into fire spewing bombs. Uh, the strongest spell that they get is called Stone Storm, which is a 7th level spell that creates a vortex of swirling, battering rocks and stones. 
It has a radius of over 300 feet, and in the area, things just kinda get battered by a tornado of rocky death. Thank you guys for watching. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, 5e Magic Shop, Morgan Johnson, Rusty Rain, Dog Feeder, The Great Codini, Omega Scales, Terry Culp, Benjamin Busters, Folky951, Ordorix, Abim Kurshap, Thomas Hunt, Soulless Rider, Stephen, Lost Crusader, Stalia, Treb909, Trevor Hess, The Living Guild Pack, Describe, Herbert Johnson, The Wizard's Vault, James the Perverted, Shoddycast, Jesse Feliciano, Lucas Syrek, Naktor Ashura, Brian Camp, John Harley, John the Wicked, Shane and Sam Skinner, Warren Smith, Baruch, Alisa Kestrel, Kristen Coleman, Holy Five, Flameback 200, and Merton Games for supporting me on Patreon at the 25 dollar level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching, thank you for being here. Make sure to check out that pretty F, both what they don't tell you about Dragon Hordes, and Monster Classes 1. Very exciting stuff is coming, guys. I hope you guys have been liking the PDFs. I've been loving making them, and like I said, so many cool things are coming up, so I hope you guys are excited about that. But yeah, I'll see you guys. My, my voice is like killing me. I, doing these long videos, man, they just obliterate my throat, so uh, I'll see you guys next time.